Yes. Once you've let everybody in, if you want to just pop that back over to me anyway. Yeah. Because we can have the conversation, but then I think what we'll do, have the conversation first. Yeah. And then you can back it, drop, it, drop it back over because I can see everybody then, you know? <laughs> Don't worry too much. It'll, it'll be you, so. yeah. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? Is everyone has everyone returned? Yeah, Eric, you uh, can lead on this part, mate. Okay, no, fair enough. All right, well listen, guys, we had a great conversation. Coach Ryan, I'm gonna ask you at the end to kind of go into those trends you were just talking about. So I think that could be very good for everybody. Um can everybody here, if not, can you guys put yourself on mute? We're gonna start with Coach Chad's group. Uh, Coach Chad, I'll put you on the spot to then identify who's in your group, please. And they can uh, just, if they could just present just a couple of findings, it would be fantastic. Perfect. So we, we were lucky enough, Tony is in our group, um, Zach and Audrey, and where's my last dude? Um, I missed you Edward. one. Edward, I'd say, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Edward. And so our, our group, um, <laughs> Everybody was new, so this was the first week, including myself. So Tony pulled it um, and gave us some good information. Um, so a couple of things that I think we hit on positioning, uh, first and foremost. Um, Chad, yeah. let your group talk. They got to talk. Not you, man. Perfect. Not you. We want to hear from the kids. I, I love it. Well, I'll tell you, what, I'll, put, I'll put Audrey on the spot first. Since, uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Audrey, what, what were a couple of your takeaways there? Um, I like talking about the one, like one v ones, or like when a player like take a, takes a touch forward, like how to decide if to go with your hands or like close down the angle. Um, and like knowing when, like making decisions on if you should go out or stay home. Nice. <laughs> Zach, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, I would. I liked um, how we were talking about dealing with the different balls that are outside the 18 rather than inside the 18. Whether you come out with your head, your feet, your chest, you control it or you send it up the pitch. If it's in the box, you dive with your feet. All that is just the split decisions that you have to make as a goalkeeper. I feel it was, it was a very good conversation with um, Tony, Eddie, Audrey, and uh, Chad. Nice. Well said, Zach. Very mature there, brother. Coach Sam. Hey, Turn it over to you and your group. If you could elaborate or have your group elaborate on that, please. Coach Sam Gribowitz. There we go. <laughs> I saw the subtle like that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of Sams on this call. You got to be specific. <laughs> I do need to be specific. Uh, so in our group, right. uh, it was me, Steve, Rowan, and Richard. Um, so we'll start with Rowan because Richard's new. So Rowan, take it away. Um, so all we talked about is the uh, diagram with the one, two, three, four, and then defend defending the space and the area and the goal. And what are the cues of what, like how they would play the through balls in and where you would be in different situations like that. So... Can you be a little bit more specific for the group on the <laughs> one, two, three, and four? <laughs> so the one is in your, um, like, obviously in your goal and around. Um, two was in your half, like your defending half. Three is in their offensive half. And then four is also in their defending half. Okay. Um, Nice. Where is uh, we have, we're missing one group. Who was the other coach that had another group besides myself? Tony, did you have a group? I was in that group with Chad. You were in that group. Coach Sam, did you have a group? Yeah, I had one. I was with Ethan, Hannah, and Andy and Sam. All right. I'll let you guys continue. If you guys can elaborate, put anything additional on top of that. <laughs> so, I'll talk. So... We basically talked about the three defending areas of defend the space, defend the area, and defending the goal, and like what um, tactics we should use, like like the diving at feet, the smothering, and one to do those at those spots. But we basically focused on defending the goal and area and talking about the 1v1s of whenever we go out for 1v1s, we have to be careful watching the um, 
strikers positioning on way they're kicking it and when they make a mistake or a bigger touch we can go and explode out and also we have to do our communication of calling out keeper to letting you know the people around you saying hey i'm coming out be aware blah blah and all that stuff to like get him like scared to say oh let her have the ball let him have the ball i don't want to get in there and get hurt with them being there so Good. and we also talked about robustness of being like um confident and brave of going out and not being scared to get hurt or anything while you're going out for 1v1. Awesome. Good. Nice job. Nice yeah. job. Good, uh, good. My group, I want to talk to, uh, talk about two things for me. Elaborate on the starting position. What's your starting position look like when you're defending the space? And also, can you talk about um, anticipation and anticipating that ball and how, how you might go into that, what the deciding, what the uh, chronological order is of your decisiveness? Oh. Who is in my group? Put you, take your fell self off mute, please. <laughs> um, so, like with the uh, the starting position when we're defending the space, if like we recognize there's a potential for a through wall behind our lines, we can get that uh, one foot forward. We're in a good spot where we get that split second um, first explosive step towards the ball. Um, could be the difference between getting there and not getting there. And then just the uh, like the chronological. Um, that you go through is just like reading the uh, like the back like your back line and then the attackers just what the what it looks like is there a potential for a through ball what's the space and look like how far out is the ball just a bunch of different sort of stuff you go through to read the likelihood of there being a through ball but then also just being aware still of defending the area and the goal so you're not getting caught out either way well summarized well summarized coach Ryan added a lot of value to that thought process on trying to anticipate for that through ball to defend that space um, and Ryan, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, like just 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 a couple more. Okay? I feel like there's some there's a lot of important points that you know was mentioned just now. Um, but we also you know gotta gotta remember, you know, when the game is happening, there's a lot of variables, you know, and a lot of variables may be who is my defenders, you know. One, I'm anticipating the the the, the ball being played. One, and Based off my personal ability or physical attributes, can am I am I fast enough to get this ball off the, before it, it it you know it reaches the striker? Where is my defender recovering? And all these variables is the ball wide? Is the ball a center of my goal? So all of these stuff impact my decision. What I'm going to do, where I'm going to do, and how I'm going to do it. You know, I, I I tend to see a lot of a lot of goalkeepers now actually have defenders recovering well and they're still breaking the neck to come off to, to defend the space. There is no need. In that moment, the area and the goal is the most important point because your defender will, you know, either delay or come back and, you know, because they're good enough or quick enough. What I'm also seeing in today's trend is the ball played through and, you know, goalkeepers are already resorting to just default to getting that K or that black position, you know, and it's now strikers are like, what? I thought you, you were coming for me or coming to take the ball off my feet. Then it's an easy dribble around you, you know, so there is so much factors. And again, a lot of it depends on who you are, you know, your ability, your defender's ability, and your ability to read the game and see those moments and then select the right tool at the moment, whether it be a smother, you know, um, diving at the feet, a block. So, again, it's, it's not as simple as it is, but the more we see that situation, then it becomes automatic, you know. You know, I, for one, I've gone through processes of failing and failing and no one, you know, no one, I make better decision based off the fact that I fail so often, you know. So that's my two cents. Ryan, I love what you said. It's like having all those tools in the toolbox or, or the clubs in the golf bag, right? And it's, and it's a matter of, you know, also knowing when to use those certain techniques. Because I see a lot of kids, and I think we briefly talked about it in our group, resorting to the K save, and it might not be the right moment. You know, whereas you might be want to use something else as you refer to. So it's the when on the training is, is really important to me. And I, I love how you said that. that. That's the key, Eric. I think, uh, you know, our goalkeepers are so influenced these days by what they may see, you know, at the top level and in, in, you know, in games on TV and things like that. And I think ultimately, guys, it's about you making your own informed decisions but also what's best for you. You're all different. There's no two keepers are exactly the same. We all have different attributes, different skill sets. We all have a different mindset. So, you know, what, what might work for one goalkeeper may not work for you necessarily. Now, it doesn't hurt for you to try those things, but ultimately, 
you've got to find a skill set, you know, and, you know, I use the, the, the um, analogy of, of having your, your clubs in the bag in terms of golf. You know, what, what clubs fit into your bag and what, what's, what clubs suit you in terms of types of actions and saves that you're going to make. And that's the key. So, yes, you know, absorb the information that you're seeing and that you're getting from what you're watching. But, you know, do go and try it. If it doesn't work for you, you don't use it. If it does, fine. Um, but I think, Eric, you're right. It's, it's the when, where and how to use these type of actions that is vitally important. And, um, you know, you, just one thing before we move on. You talked about, in particular, defending the space. Now, we're, we're not saying, guys, that you would forever be in that front foot forward position. There's always the ebb and flow of the game, you know. So you'll be moving naturally. But at some point, there will be a trigger for you. In other words, for you to get yourself into that ready stance position, like a sprinter that we referred to, so that that would then enable you to set off and move forward towards the ball. Um, Sam, I know you've touched on that recently. So what would one of those triggers be, for instance? Give us an example. So we spoke about like having that, that heavy touch from the attacker in, inside the box. So they got close control of the ball. All of a sudden, they might take it with the outside of their foot. That's when we can then get in that ready position, head down, dive in at feet. Get what spot. about what about when um, you know when the ball's higher up the pitch, further away, and we're talking yeah, about might, defending the space? It might be the um, the midfielder with the ball looking up, uh, looking for that through ball, um, looking at their action. Are they going to thread it through along the floor? Are they going to loft it through? Um, and what distance have we got to cover to, to get there? I know we spoke about it last week with the, the Edison incident. Um, obviously, he was very advanced because he's a, a very good um, footballing goalkeeper. So he has that high high position ready to, to deal with the three balls, as does Neuer. So, yeah. again, it's that what type of keeper are you? Are you one that, yeah. that drops back and, and does this and makes saves like maybe a, a De Gea does? Um, or are you that keeper that's always on that front foot looking to, to help your defenders out by... Do you suggest that's a more aggressive stance then? Yeah, definitely. Ones that want to want to play football, want to help that, that that team out. And again, what, what team are you playing in? Mm. Um, a, a Man City team are going to have a lot of possession and maybe the, the teams are going to want to look to go over the top. So yeah. well, um, Munich are the same. And I guess Munich, yeah, when you look, so, at, you look at the, the goalkeepers, we talked about Edison, Neuer and those type of goalkeepers. Mm -hmm. They kind of fit into the, that, that, that team's philosophy. You know, yeah, they're yeah. always going to have a lot of possession of the ball. There are going to be a lot of spaces uh, left in behind them with, it, with a great deal of space for the goalkeeper to look after. So I would guess in that sense, the goalkeeper that fits in with that philosophy, that team philosophy, must be quite an aggressive-minded goalkeeper and want to play with a high aggressive position. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, Tony, Tony, I want, to, I, I want to add one more thing, Tony. Um, it's 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 just important that we also know our opponents, you know. Like, if you know you're gonna play against a Raheem Sterling, for example, <laughs> he's rapid, he's lightning. You don't want to go in a foot race with Raheem Sterling, so <laughs> it's probably best you you at a good standing start, starting position, balance and wait for that player to come to you, because mm -hmm. then he's not the greatest at finishing. But if you go at him, he's probably gonna dribble around you. So these are some things you gotta always be thinking about. Who am I playing against? What are their strengths? And how does that affect my next decision? Most definitely. And that, that's, you know, in, I think in, in the group I was with, we talked about perception, guys, didn't we? About your external perception and your internal perception. Knowing your surroundings, knowing the environment, but recognise very quickly, as quick as you can, the capabilities and the strengths of you, your opponents because that then would also affect your decisions when it comes to um, defending the goal, defending the area, defending the space. So, fantastic stuff, guys. Brilliant. Sam, do you want to pop that back over to me or can I just share it now? You can share it now, mate. Okay, yours. so Eric, I think we'll move on. Yes, sir, please. As I said to you, um, this week, um, short and sweet. So, um, I'll do this as a slideshow. So, forgive me if, I, um, if I'm not on screen. Okay, so we're going to look at phase two. And again, guys, if anybody needs to stop me during this process um, to have a conversation, but we will be breaking this down and having a conversation once we've gone through the clips and so on. So 
phase one, we looked at um, leaving the line to secure the ball, smother, dive at feet. Now we're looking at a situation where the goalkeepers may be advanced, can't quite get to the ball to secure the ball, but they get into a position where they're away from the goal, obviously within the goal area, so they can still use the hands. And they get to a point where they must stop, get themselves between the ball and the goal, okay? And then they're set into a ready position, and then obviously they make a save. So what are some of the key factors? So we look at, and again, guys, this is subjective, and this is we're keeping it simple with not too much detail. This isn't obviously all of the detail because it would be too deep and too long for us to go through everything. But we just want to make sure that you get an idea of what some of the key factors are here. And that's why I've talked that at the top. But there will be some, obviously some more small detail that you would need to consider and think about. And this obviously as well, guys, isn't just a technical thing. There's tactical things to be, to be considered. You'd look at the physical side, the psychological side, and obviously the social side in particular when we talk about communication and so on. So we must look at the goalkeeper's angle and speed of approach. And thinking about, again, going back to the image we shared last week when we talk about the goalkeeping line, just with the possibility that the player um, may take a, a touch early, may try and finish early. So are we in a position where we always have, when we're approaching the ball, our body between the ball and the goal? In other words, that we can defend the goal equally both sides as we move towards the ball at speed and approach the ball. Okay? Um, a controlled, excuse me, a controlled and balanced ready position um, prior to, to um, sorry guys, that's just moved there, yeah, prior to the shot, okay, so obviously guys, we talked about the physical side in terms of the approach, the acceleration, so setting off, moving at speed to get pressure on the ball, pressure on the player, Always being balanced. So what we, we, we generally try to talk about is as we move, try to let the bottom half do the work rather than running with the hands. Because obviously, if at some point, again, like I suggested, the attacker gets close to the ball or they have good control and they see us moving and they want to finish early, if our hands aren't in a, a good position, we may not be able to use the hands to make the save. So always being balanced as we're moving. Okay recognising when we can or we can't transfer pressure to the attacker to disrupt the shot. So, in other words, at what point do we either continue to move or do we stop and then recognise another chance, a little window to actually get a little bit more pressure on the ball, on the attacker, to then create more indecision in the attacker when they're in possession of the ball. And I think, obviously, the key one at the bottom there is the patience to stay big OK, and again, we talked about that a little bit last week in terms of when we, we talked about the Leno situation with those two actions, Eric, Sam, if you remember those. Um, yep. Great opportunity to stay yeah. big in the goal, but dropped himself down and made himself a lot smaller, just opening up more of the goal. So these are some of the decisions, guys, that you have to make. And most of these are made when you're on the move. So, and they're also made in split seconds. And there's a lot of things that you must think about. So, angle and speed of approach. Is the body balanced as you move prior to a shot being taken? Recognising when you can or can't put the pressure on the attacker. And then the patience to stay big, be brave, mentally tough, be a big frame in the goal. Okay. Coaches, any thoughts on that before I move into the clips? Okay. Good. Okay, guys. I'm going to let these play a couple of times. Um, just to let you see these. So in all these clips, you'll see that the goalkeeper's moving towards the ball, away from the goal. And let's have a look at some of their decisions and the outcomes that happen. Love this one in particular. Joe Hart. Great save with his feet. Again, slow motion. Again, look at his body position, his body shape. Okay, put them back on again. Okay. I love that angle. Yeah. Okay, so 
Can everybody see that? Nobody got a problem with that, have they? Okay. So, when again, you look at this here. So, Joe Hart's decided to advance. And again, this is what we talked about. Where's the ball, everybody? Is it at the player's feet or out of the player's feet? Just out of the player's feet. Yeah, it's out of his feet. Okay. So, now it's at his feet. What's Joe Hart done? Set. He stopped. Okay. So he recognized an opportunity to move forward. The ball was out of the attacker's feet. As soon as the player now gets good control of the ball, he holds his position. Again, look at that position. Remember we talked about the goalkeeping line. From the ball, through the goalkeeper to the middle of the goal. If we had a piece of string there, Sam, like we talked about, I think we could probably get that from the ball through Joe to the middle of the goal, would you suggest? Yeah. So if the, if the player tries to play it down Joe's right hand side, he can use his right foot, his right hand, and he's protecting the goal. If it goes down his left, he can do the same equally. Okay. Great visual. Gets set, pressures on the attacker, uses his foot to save. You and in could that even... one there. I'm going to Tony, you can go. even go back to that last save. There was a yeah. shooter's cue as he turned his hips and head up, too, yeah. before Joe made that save. Yeah. He turns here. Yeah. So we did a slow-mo. So there, as he opens his hips, it gives Joe Hart a little bit of a clue, yeah, that he's going to try and go down Joe Hart's left-hand side purely and simply because of his body shape and he's going to go with his right foot, yeah? And again, this one drops off. But notice, guys, he probably realised that he'd come too far. He starts to drop off, but he's only dropping off and moving back towards the goal and the player doesn't have control of the ball. Once the player gets control of the ball or the ball's close to the player's feet and he can get a shot off. Notice how the goalkeeper has now stopped and set. So the timing of this, the awareness and the perception of the goalkeeper recognising the triggers is vitally important. Then he can make the save. Okay? Any questions on that, guys? Um, I don't have a question, but uh, there's something I'd like to add. I like in all of these videos that, um, like, the goalkeeper stays up as long as possible instead of going down too early, which yeah. gives the attacker more of a goal issue that they all stay up, see it, react until the very end, and then make the reaction save rather than guessing, anticipating, yeah. and beating a goal. So would, would you suggest then, Zach, that they are being patient? Yes, I agree. I, I would definitely say that. Yeah, so they recognise the triggers, they've got the timing right, but also they're being patient. They're not, they're not sort of anticipating, are they? They're not no. guessing. They're not guessing. They're kind of more reacting. So, right. yeah, great. great. That. So, I believe that you've seen that. So they're actually getting themselves into a really good position and saying to the attackers, right, you've got to come up with something really good to beat me now. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to anticipate... And obviously, the goalkeepers are picking up the triggers. Fantastic. Yeah. Well done, Zach. Good spot. Anybody else? I mean, they're using, they're using the right save at the right time. Yeah. So, so answer me this question, anybody. This one here, do you think Joe Hart had time to get his left hand down to make a collapsing save? No. No. Anybody? No. no. So, that's what we talk about, the when, where, and how. So although we want to try and use our hands, although we probably want to try and use our traditional diving techniques, when the ball is this close, it's highly unlikely that Joe Hart would have time to get his hand down to make the save. The hand drops, but it's not going to be as quick as throwing the foot out to get the, the contact on the ball. Tony, I, I, yes. I want to add just one thing. Um... It is also important, then, this is where it comes down to the psychological part of the goalkeeper. The willingness to, 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 to keep this ball out of the net any means necessary. Of course. You know, at this point in time, it doesn't matter what the K-block, the, uh, the, the smother, 
you just got to just keep the ball out of the net. And in order for you to do that, you got to have your eyes on the ball at all time. So yeah, that was something that I picked up that's very consistent with all of these goalkeepers. They never took their eye off the ball and they were willing to do whatever it takes in the moment. Yeah. I, th I think what we, we're talking about, Ryan, it's just being effective and efficient with the goalkeeping. Um, it doesn't always have to be textbook. And in the moment, as a goalkeeper, you have to make an instant decision. But this is why we're saying to you guys that the more clubs in your bag, in other words, the more different types of save that you have at your disposal, you'll be able to call upon them in any given situation should you require that type of save. So I don't think for a second that Joe Hart hasn't worked on that type of save in practice. Is it instinctual in that moment? Yes. Has he practiced it as a technique in training? Yes. So they link together in the moment, in the blink of an eye, and this is how fantastic goalkeeping is in terms of the skill sets that we have and the decisions that we have to make ultimately we can call upon them in the blink of an eye and, and we create a fantastic action like that, yeah? Um, just here for you guys. Eric, I don't know if you want to touch on this because I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the detail with your goalkeeper. So do you want to just talk about the practice? Yeah. So if, here, guys, you see uh, um, basically for the coaches out there, a, a plan in a sense to um, incorporate that decision-making in, into the game. And here's what a, what a, for the players out there, here's what a coach's session would look like on their clipboard or in their, in their hands when they're running this session. And you're going to see it's game-like, it's at game speed, and they use different angles. Notice the different angles on how the, goal, the, the field players are coming at you, but you're also practicing, and, and I love the phrase that Tony uses, you're trying, we're trying to get you to utilize all the different options or all the different clubs in your bag to make that save and try and make it as game-like as possible. So before the session, this part of the session, you might be doing some technical training on that exact save or those saves, whether it's all, you know, all four of them that we mentioned. Here's where the application or the game application would come into play. So it's the step-by-step -step to get to that game situation. And here's a good um, detailed uh, lesson plan on that. So I just want to make sure keepers understand what a, what's going on in the, in the coach's mind as they're going through a training session with you. What we've got here, Eric, obviously we, you know, you look at the, the, the practice setup. There's two groups of players. Now you could have four groups of players so that the goalkeeper gets a chance to work on balls um, coming from either side, if that makes sense. Um, you could also do it into one goal. So you could have three lines where you could have a, a right, a left and a central attacker. Um, you could also have situations here where the player on the ball is actually playing another player in. So there's many, many progressions and different ways of doing this practice. What we're trying to get here is that, that situation where the ball is with the attacker. Um, but if you notice, there's a, there's a coned area. Um, and the attackers can't actually score until they get into that coned area. So you have what, what we've got is rather than just having the end product, you've got to build up to what's happening. So the goalkeeper has time to assess the speed of the player on approach, um, their, their ball contacts, you know, when they get their head up, when they look down, and so on and so forth. Lots of different variants for the goalkeeper to think in this way, but also for the coaches to be creative in how they might evolve and develop this practice. And I would suggest there's probably eight or ten, at least, different progressions that you could make in this practice. We're just showing you kind of one idea, really. All right? Okay, guys? Any questions? Awesome. Okay, so um, let's just look at now... Um, we're going to move into phase three, which is now a situation where... A little bit more of an add-on to what we've just worked on. So we're looking at phase three where the goalkeeper advances and they actually engage the player with the ball to block or spread. Okay? Again, short and sweet detail because we're mindful how long we've actually got on the webinar. Not all of the detail incorporated. We can discuss any points that you feel that we've missed or coaches if you want to add anything onto this. That's brilliant. We'll show you some clips and then we'll have another little discussion around that. Okay? So again, what are the 
the key sort of factors that we, we can touch on here. So the goalkeeper would choose to block, yeah, further out or smother with the hands, yeah, based off the distance to the attacker. So as we've all, all talked about, guys, and I think, Ryan, you touched on this, our first priority is always, guys, if we see the chance, can we secure the ball by smothering or diving at feet? That, that's, for me, that's a gimme. Um, we always want to try and, and, and secure the ball if we can. If we can't, then we must have the other options. Then we must recognise, guys, that we can get close enough to, to the ball to, to transfer the pressure to the attacker and disrupt the shot, similar to what we talked about before. But then we must also think about narrowing the angle yeah, while we're executing the save. So we now might also make that next move as the ball is played. So in other words, dropping into the blocking shape or moving into that spread technique with momentum as the ball is being struck towards us. So we make the decision, we get there, but we can't smother. We realise we can get a little bit closer to get real pressure on the ball. We can't secure it. So now that's when we come into using our, our block and our, our, um, our spreading techniques. Okay. Any questions on that? Anything to add coaches? Comfortable. Very. Okay. What what I've done, guys? Because obviously, you know, I have a, a, a many many years of background in futsal. I don't know if anybody of you have played um, futsal or been around the, the sport. It's a fantastic game. Um, but a lot of what I, I've done with the goalkeepers in futsal, in other words, when we use the the block or the cross shape, the thought processes the that sort of the goalkeeper thinks along and, and, and works with are very similar to what we would use as a football goalkeeper anyway. So I'm just going to share with you, I'm not going to read them all out, some of the key points here um, down the right-hand side of your screen. So where are the shooting lines, the passing angles? What is the distance between the player and me? Uh, which is my, their strong side. So here you can see the players going left-footed, standing on his right foot, is going to play with the left. Have a look at which way the goalkeeper's turning. Very important, that. The player's trying to sort of play down the goalkeeper's right-hand side, so the goalkeeper's going to turn to the right, OK? Even if they try and drag it across them towards their, the goalkeeper's left, the trailing arm, trailing leg can still protect the goal, OK? Um, what is the attacker's speed on approach? We've already talked about that, OK? With which leg would the attacker shoot and so on and so forth. We've talked about perception here when you look underneath there, at, um, under the five um, elements there. Talked about the goalkeeper's perception. Um, where's the helping defender? So, okay, is the pressure on the ball? Again, all of these things affect the goalkeeper's decision-making processes, okay? Now, when you look at the goalkeeper's body, and this is why we call it the cross shape, guys. I think we alluded to this last week. The goalkeeper's literally using all four limbs, all four points of their body um, as save-making mechanisms. And again, that's why it's called the cross shape um, in, in Spain and, and other areas. But what I've done here is try to um, label it for you. So when you look at the, the, the numbers that I've put um, for each part of the body, that correlates and links to what part of the goal the goalkeeper would actually be able to save the ball with with that part of the body, okay? I've also put the central area as a fifth save mechanism because obviously the central core, um, you know, if it's a tree, it's the tree trunk, whatever you want to call it, that central part of the body, that protect, protects the middle of the goal, okay? Anybody not sure about that? Is everybody okay with that? Do, do you relate to that? And do you see what I'm trying to, to put across here? Yeah? Now, does it look the same in football? Well, there's your answer, okay? So all I've done here, we've got we've got clip, a clip of Joe Hart. Um, reversed is on the other side. So this time, obviously, Joe is now working. Um, he's, he's put pressure on the ball. He's turning to his left. The player has got his head down. He's going to shoot with his right foot. Joe's decided to get to that point and try and form this shape. But again, I've tried to relate it, guys, to what we talk what we talked about in terms of futsal and related that into football. Now, I know the goals are bigger. The areas, the spaces are bigger and different in football. But when you're this close to the attacker, for me, the principles are the same. 
okay? It doesn't change. You can still try and protect all parts of the goal with the use of your body in this situation, okay? And again, just some key pointers. Where are the shooting lines, passing angles, what is the distance between me and the player, which is their strong side. And again, you can see he's going right-footed here. Which leg is he carrying the ball with? What is the attacker speed? And so on. And here, this is the outcome. So what you see here is Joe Hart then decides to move more into a spread type of save. He keeps that left arm quite high. He's picked up the path of the ball as it's travelling. And now he's protecting that top corner of the goal, which is where the attacker was going to try and shoot. Okay? Any questions on that? Anything to add, coaches? Awesome. Okay. Well, here's the footage. Okay? Not just this save, but there are a number of other saves using a similar type uh, decision in terms of leaving the goal to block or spread. Okay? Here you go. This was a game where Joe Hart had an unbelievable evening. Kasper Michael, of course. Very much in the mould of his uh, of his father. <laughs> okay, so let me just go back. Okay, so I'm going to slow-mo this one down. So, this is what we've talked about, guys. Hopefully you can all see this. The goalkeeper now leaving the line. He's advancing. Now, if you remember the phase two, the goalkeeper actually stopped and set. But Joe Hart has recognised that he can still get close enough to get more pressure on the ball. So he doesn't stop and set. He ultimately times his movement into the ball to coincide with the contact of the ball. Is that risky? It possibly could be. But also sometimes, guys, as goalkeepers, you've got to trust your instincts. You've got to trust your judgment. He's recognised that he can get pressure on the ball, get down the line of the ball quick enough, open his body big enough to enable him to make that contact and ultimately get the save off. Yeah? And there you go. Any questions? Anything to add, coaches? The only thing I'd add, Tony, is you even look at the shooter's cue. Uh, he's really focused on the ball coming from behind him. So he's almost running in a position, watching the back side of his body or the back part yeah. of him, not looking at Joe Hart. So yeah. he's really being a, super aggressive, knowing that this forward does not see him coming until the last, last minute upon strike. And I think, Eric, that correlates with what we've already said to all the goalkeepers about picking your moment, when to right. move. Right. And I think and again, when you look at Joe, yes, he's looking at the ball, but and I can't say for definite, but in my view, I think he's probably definitely looking at the attacker's um, eyes, head, where they're focusing, <coughs> and recognising that. And Joe's probably saying to himself, hey, this guy hasn't looked up yet. I've still got a chance now to move. The ball's still out of his feet. I can continue on my movements. I might have to stop and set here, but hey, he still hasn't got contact. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And you use that momentum and speed to actually force his body into the ball to become that impenetrable uh, block mechanism, you know? I think I, I think I saw the one the first time that forward even looked in a forward direction when he was already inside the 18. And Joe, Joe Hart's already at the 7, 8. It's like right around here he's potentially looking up. Possibly. Look where Joe Hart is already. Yeah. But Very then impressive. there's the timing. So even if he does look there, he puts his head back down, the ball's out of his feet, and, and obviously Joe has then recognised, right, I'm going to go. And he's, he's just took what I would consider to be um, a calculated gamble as such, you know? And ultimately, he comes out with the ball. Any questions, any thoughts, anybody? Ryan, Chad, Steve? Yeah, um, for that specific video, man, um, you guys hit most of the points. But when you look at the picture, you see a lot of his defenders making recovery run. 
So what yeah. Joe initially did in this moment, he pretty much made that, that, that striker's decision for him. Because even if he decides to dribble, there is two or three defenders making the cover run. And yeah. if he beats him, he's going wide, which is also equal to a yeah. save. Because you, if you can't protect the middle, you force them wide. Because then it becomes a highly difficult chance to, to score. So I thought it was a, that this was a brilliant video, by the way. Yeah. Well, I think the, the key thing is, Ryan, like that there, there's so many positive things <laughs> that we can pick up for our goalkeepers. Um, and the amount of depth of detail we can go in for, for our keepers, that's what we're trying to do here. Now, like I've said to you before, Ryan, this is subjective. There may be other goalkeepers, other coaches will come in with other views and other ideas. Yep. But I think the amount of detail we can go into with the amount of support that we can get on here for, for our keepers, fantastic. And, and little bits of gold dust like this. And I think you're very right. And this is a key when we are um, doing our, our practice sessions. And this is the importance of the goalkeeper, not just practicing this in isolation. He's actually practicing it with the players. Because then what you can do as goalkeepers and also as coaches, we can affect and influence not just the role of the goalkeeper, but what are the, re what are the roles and responsibilities of the defenders that are around the goalkeeper in any given situation. But also if we think to our social elements that we talk about, huge amount of, of understanding and communication that goes into this one situation that we need to replicate in training and in practice. And that then helps the goalkeepers and their teammates build fantastic relationships. So like you've said, as soon as Joe Hart goes here, his defenders realise that he's the one now acting as the last defender. They've now got a role and responsibility to try and get back and defend the goal. And, and that can only be built in practice with, with each other, you know? And Tony, absolutely, absolutely to Tony. That. Say again, Ryan, sorry. No, no, I said absolutely, you know, I agree 100%. And, and Tony, if we go back to that lesson plan that we had looked at earlier, yeah. if that this is almost a direct replica of, of that, of that, that, that breakaway one-on-one -on -one one. training session that we had. Yeah, right there. I mean, if you yeah. look at the, 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 where the forward's coming from up top or from the B angle, mm -hmm. that person is almost in that exact spot that we just saw on that film. And, and if there's one thing I'd add to this, maybe with like talking about those, like the variations, maybe adding a defensive run three <coughs> seconds after the, the forward B goes yeah. in just to put a little bit of pressure from behind so that that, that forward's not taking What you time. could have with that, Eric, is you could have. So if you look, guys, if you look at the left of the image, so you've got the player with the ball just above the letter A. So if you take the ball away from that player, and allow the player behind to come onto the pitch, onto the field, and play the ball, then maybe wait half a second. Once they've played it, the player without a ball can chase the ball like an attacker. The player that's played the ball can then become that recovery defender. So what you could do is you could get your players to work in pairs, and each time they have a go, they reverse their role. They're either attacking or they're recovering defenders. I love it. Just and, a simple, and, and, way, simple way of getting you know, ultimate returns. And then that, that communication element, you know, that psychological situation, can I go, do I stay, what does a defender do, all of that stuff. But again, fantastic, heck, it's just another progression. So there's there's another one. So we got Absolutely. nine or ten now, which is cool. And it's so, right off the clip. You know, it's right off the clip we just saw. So it's an actual in-game moment. And that's where I think what we try to replicate in our practice sessions. And that's a great, yeah. just, great detailed um, observation right there. Yeah. Good, I like it. Good job, guys. So I think that just to finalise it, guys, what we need to sort of think about then, because there will be an after. There's obviously the during. So we're talking about, you know, phase one, two and three. Are we in a position where we can secure the ball? Yeah. So was the ball secured? And if so, what are the, the outcomes and what are the decisions? And if not, similar. So phase one, we talked about securing the ball which was smothering, diving the feet. Phase two, we've talked about uh, leaving the line to engage, but then to save, so to get there, to, to set and save. Phase three, we've talked about leaving the line to engage, but then to block or spread. Okay? So 
what I want you to just quickly think about, guys, um, if anybody wants to come up with the answers. So on the save attempt, the ball was secured. Yeah, so the goalkeeper secured the ball. What's the next thing? So what's the after? Who wants to come up with an answer? Can we try and leave this to the keepers? What might be the after? Scan the options going forward. Look for really? counter-attack opportunities and kind of the spacing, the timing of the game, whether you need to slow it down maybe or maybe push the pace and look for a quick counter-attacking option. Right. Who said that? Edward. That was Edward I can't yeah. see you. I've only got four on my screen. Edward, fantastic. Um, who, was, who was the first one? Uh, Brad. Brad, brilliant. Yeah. So, listen, both fantastic answers. Okay. The key one, I think, for me is the context of the game. Yeah. So, where are we at in the game? What, what's the situation? Are we winning? Are we losing? Are we drawing? You know, is it the first 10 minutes? Is it the last five? Is it just before or just after half time? So many things now, so many variables, so many states of the game that are going to affect what we do next. Also, the options that we have. You know, what have I got on? You know, what, what's the simplest play? I think the other thing we need to think about, guys, which, is, which is kind of aligns with what you said, what's the strategy of the team? You know, the head coach might have said, first 20 minutes, you get the ball, I want it going long quickly. So the goalkeeper now has no choice but to actually look furthest up the field that they can and then to distribute the ball long and, and, and as far as possible. It might be that the head coach has said, can we calm the play down? Can we settle us down, get us into the game? Let's look at keeping the ball. Let's not try and force things. So fantastic answers, guys. It's context of the game that's vitally important. Um, counter-attack was mentioned, wasn't it? So transition, we call it, OK? Can we transition quickly? Do we need to? Where are we going to do that? Who are we going to do that with? And so on, OK? Anything else, guys, that you would think if we'd secured the ball? Coaches, anything? Happy? OK. So that's all I put there, simply. Is it a quick transition? Game context, huge. Okay. That then determines and dictates, and as I've just suggested there, at least seven or eight different situations. Okay. Somebody different then now. What happens if the ball isn't secured? What could the outcome be? We've seen many during this situation. Um, a rebound that goes short back to the attacker. Brilliant. And what might happen? So what, what's the role of the goalkeeper then, Zach? Jack up, look for a second shot, depending on where the ball goes. It's, um, if it's near you, you can look to jump back on it. If it's at their feet, make the same decisions, get set. You Brilliant. Know, it just depends on where the ball so what, goes. What, what, what would we call that, Zach? What would we call that, that phase? Um, rebound. Rebound, or what we call it, we term it a, reco a recovery save. Fantastic. What about if the ball's still in play, but the goalkeeper can't affect it? Somebody else? He just needs to get in the ball line. Brilliant. Just so, find the ball and get set with it. Brilliant. So a recovery line. So basically, they get a position now where they're on the goalkeeping line, recovery line, they can now defend the defend the uh, the goal as well as as best as they can. Yeah, everybody agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Also, guys, again, depending on the situation, the ball could go out of play. So then it could be a quick recovery into a set play situation, throw in, uh, corner, and so on. Okay, um, but the two I was looking for, if we secure it, is it quick transition? Are we counter attacking? But what's the context of the game? What's the philosophy we need to play to? So on and so forth. Where are my teammates? Who am I going to play to? How and where? If it's not secured, we talk about recovery save and recovery line. Okay? Fantastic stuff. And again, guys, I'm just sharing with you here. Eric, if you want to just touch on these again. Yeah, again, but you guys to see it, these examples are really good for us coaches, you know, to get ideas as to how to train this. So coaches obviously take note for your own um, individual use. But at the same time, guys, as a goalkeeper, really look at the details in the red box and, and figure out what we're trying to accomplish. I think the more you can see the progression into a game-like situation, the, the more you're going to appreciate training 
these game-like situations. So you're seeing here, you know, it, it's almost looked like they're playing almost a restricted area where they can't go inside of 20 yards to their, to their own goal or they, when they go through, defenders can't go and defend in those last 20 yards. So it's an automatic one-on-one -on -one situation. You know, it's not just standing on your line waiting. You know, you're moving in line with the ball, anticipating that heavy touch or that through ball, you know, also looking for that shot from, from distance. So understanding that and what you're working on really goes a long way with having that information or that knowledge resonate um, when dealing with these types of uh, training sessions. Again, Eric, just this one here is more of a functional practice, of course. We've sectioned off the 18-yard the box down the, uh, down the sides. Um, again, this is literally done with attackers, but you can have defenders in there. You can vary the types of play. You could even have like a little possession game towards the bottom end of the image, whereby you could maybe have a little possession game and then a, an attacker breaks out, but a recovering defender can go with them and so on, you know? Or, you know, a ball can be played out of the, the possession game for an attacker and then another player from the opposite team can chase them down. <laughs> loads and loads of different ways. I think what I'd say to our coaches and goalkeepers is have a look at these practices and just take them um, and, 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 and toy with them, mess with them, you know, try and adapt them, evolve them, see what you can come up with. I'd love to see. And obviously, guys, I've just given you two here. I have many, many different ways of delivering these types of practice to get the returns that I need from, from the goalkeepers I'm working with. But obviously, I can't show you all of them. I've just put a couple on as a snapshot. But please feel free to tweak, change and adapt them to suit your needs and, and the needs of your goalkeepers. OK? So, Eric, where are we on time, my friend? We're on the 65th, 70th minute. What I'd like to do is if we could not do – if we could do the breakout group as a unit, but yeah. do the, I think the next clips are of, of are they what he did well, what he didn't do well, or what he probably could he improve. If you yeah. Look at the next. yeah. Let's do that and see the two clips. And then if we could debrief as a, as a unit, and right. then we'll, we'll end it around the 75th minute. So if we have around seven minutes left. Right. And then okay. what we'll do is we're at, the, we're at where we want to be from a coaching standpoint. Yeah. And I think we're fine. But let's just combine everyone here with, with okay. this. Okay. Good clips here. I love these clips. Yeah, so I've got, guys, just two clips of Alison Becker from Liverpool. Obviously, just won the, uh, the EPL with Liverpool. Sorry about that, Sam, but we won't go into that. Um, <laughs> you being a Man United fan, but there you go. Um, now, two clips, and I'm not saying in either one that he, he did right or wrong. Uh, there's two different outcomes. Um, but I just want you guys, coaches as well, um, and we'll, we'll quickly throw it around when we come back. What did the goalkeeper do well? What might the goalkeeper need to improve next time in terms of, you know, a more successful outcome if need be? Just have a look at these. Okay, put them on again, just quickly. Clip one. This was against Norwich, I think, yeah. <laughs> Clip two. Yeah, this one's against Watford. Slightly different outcome. Okay. Yep. So I share there so I can come in and see the group. Right, go ahead. Eric Yeah, so guys, scared. what did he do well? What was both of them were with what type of save? Mother. Going for that front smother. What happened in the first one? He just took it in. Yeah, he took it in, right? And everything seemed to go from there. What about the second one? What happened? He spilled it into a, damn, a bit of a dangerous area, but he did really well to get up and recover and make the second save, forcing the ball to go wide in the end. Well done. Yeah, and I think if he just takes that first, that second clip, excuse me, when if he takes that in, plays dead, they retain possession. Now it's, it's almost like a second and a third opportunity so, and he's different. You notice he was doing anything he could too. That second save or second attempted save, he was just flailing. 
That third time, you almost saw him drop into a little bit of a K-type environment, even though that ball went wide. So he was using anything and everything to keep that out there. What would he do differently next time? Yeah, Tony, could you just play those while we talk? Is yeah. that cool? Cut them off. Thank you. What, what could he do differently in that second one? Like, what would what, – give me your opinions. What else are you thinking around Becker here? I'm sorry. But yeah, Allison, what did he, what did he do uh, wrong? What could he have done differently besides what we just said? I'd say he's got to attack the ball with his hands more. Rather, He sort of, like, slid, like, half with his feet, half with his hands, and it just sort of made it an awkward situation. But I think if he just shoots through with his hands, it's – more secure and he's not making like that hard contact with the ground that he does here. Yeah. Yeah. I, good I answer. So, so when you look at, can everybody see this? I'm slow mowing it. Yeah. So. And it goes no, in feet first too, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Look, look at his body angle. I half think here that he possibly believes the attacker is going to lunge at him. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying he's not being brave at all, but I think he's probably thinking might be a chance I'm going to get clattered here. So he kind of, his feet have come forward a little bit. I think also guys, you know, we talked about acceleration and deceleration and the angle of approach. When you look at his initial angle of approach, he has to adjust it right here. And I think that's had an effect on the actual way in which he's gone towards the ball. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's set off very quickly. Now the ball's bounced. The player's getting closer. There he adjusts his angle of approach. And he's still leading with his feet. So he's still probably running at full speed and found it very hard to get the brakes on and slow down enough to be able to lean forward and step forward into the ball. Now, if he's going to dive, like we would suggest here, to his right, what foot would he want to lead with, his left or his right foot? Right. Yeah, but notice what's his nearest foot to the ball now? Left. But there's no way, guys, he's going to be able to go forward on the angle to dive through that ball. He'd need to readjust his feet again or even slow down sooner and try and get his foot placement in reverse. The only way he can actually dive is by going backwards, purely and simply because of where his foot position is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that consequently has meant his body weight's gone backwards and he hasn't, he's reaching. Look, at his body, he's, look how far now the ball is away from him and look how outstretched his arms are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what's caused the, the loosening of the ball in that situation I, I think yeah. uh, coaches please um, correct me if I'm wrong no I find it interesting uh, watching the, the, the defenders around him as he's going down they look very relaxed as in hey we've seen this a million times he's going to take yeah. it in and then all of a sudden when that ball's bouncing you see a couple of defenders like right here watch this guy on the right side of the screen he's as calm as can be now all of a sudden he's going to be outstretched Helping him is doing whatever he can to get in there. Yeah. It's, it's, but I think uh, going going back to Zach's uh, answer originally, you know, we talked about the after. What a great response from Allison here. Agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay, the first quite, part he didn't uh, didn't quite get right, but great athleticism. Yeah, gets to his feet. Kinds of second guesses the next phase. Goes the wrong way, but then actually has enough about him to go back on himself to get a save. He's still going at the ball. He hasn't given it up. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I would suggest, although he didn't get the first part right, I think he deserves the fact that he, he didn't concede. You know? Um, mm -hmm. What about the first one, guys? Thoughts, anybody? Well, I like that he didn't. Go ahead. No, it's all you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I kind of like that he didn't default into a block save too early. Uh, yeah. He if he had a chance to where he kind of could have just jumped out and tried to spread at it. But yeah. with the uh, striker's body position not really shaping up to shoot like that, he stayed right. in his feet, uh, but also stayed low and stayed big and waited for the pass. He was yeah. able to dive forwards and cut it off directly. And Ed, Ed I'll ask you this question. To have you continue? So do you think – Where was the ball – on, in relation to the forward majority of the time when he's inside the 18? On his back foot. 
it, or it's on his foot, right? There's no space for him to yeah. like think about moving forward and stealing more space. So he does take a nice yeah. job and getting set and relaxing, knowing that that forward can just poke that by him at any moment. So he was very patient. <laughs> I, I, I also think, guys, and this is where, you know, we've talked about perception, right? And who was it that just said he didn't drop into the block early? I think that was Edward. Edward. Yeah, this is the reason why. Because he's he now knows his two defenders are out of the game. So basically, he's last man standing. It's two against one. This is like a futsal situation. I promise you, this happens all the time. But what he doesn't do is commit to that block or spread. Because he knows if he does, ultimately the player on the ball will just play the ball slightly to his left and his teammate has a simple tap in. The fact that Allison has stayed on his feet, kept his body between the ball and the goal and he's still mobile, that then enables him to get across by driving across on the dive and making the save. But I think what makes that save is his perception and awareness of what's happening around him. And this is what we're trying to say to you guys, how important you get in a constant view and a constant understanding of the ever-changing pictures in front of you is vitally important because that can define whether you can see the goal in this situation or not. For me, that's fantastic goalkeeping. Yeah, and I think uh, unbelievable awareness. To add yeah. to that, Tony, Coach Ryan made a great point earlier about knowing your, knowing your opponent as, as well and – you just tell he took all those variables in and really made a great calculated save. Yeah. Anything from anybody else? Ryan, did you want to comment on that, buddy? No, I, I just – you guys touched on all of the points, you know, the key points. Um, you know, just being balanced, keeping the body weight forward, staying on your feet as long as possible. Ultimately, it's just, it's just you know, it's whatever the game gives you, you take. You know, just try not to make up things in the game. Because yeah. that's when you get that's when you get punishment, you know. Because at, at that level, especially the, the professional level, guys are thinking two, four, five, six steps ahead of you, and we just as goalkeepers have to have the ability to think eight, nine, ten steps ahead of them. So, um, we, it's good stuff, we, man. We've got to be the yeah. chess players, haven't we? We've yeah, got to be absolutely. two or three ahead, you know, and that's absolutely. that's the key. So, Coach Chad, right, anything so. you'd want to add to that, sir? Um, just real quick, like. Uh, when we're working on breakaways, the goalkeepers know rule number one with me is you do not go down unless you're hundred percent going to win the ball. Um, it's a real bad habit. You'll see of younger kids, they'll just come flying out and go down. Right. Um, now the layer above that, what we saw in Allison's clip is his discipline there and staying up when he knew he was in a bad situation because with that <laughs> other runner there, um, so for me, that was, that was like, I love that. Uh, the other thing I'd add to that, especially with this group being relatively younger, when you close and you stay composed in those situations, a lot of times the forwards do not know how to react because it's just awkward in that they don't have a great angle. So the amount of pressure you put on them to be perfect with a shot is tough. And the other thing is they're used to the goalkeeper coming flying out where they can touch around or chip over. So, like, I, I love seeing that detail. And, again, Tony, you nailed it. He's playing chess there, right? And it's just you have to be aware of all those details, which there's been tons of details today, and that adds up. And that's, that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Coach Sam, Coach Sam, Coach Steve, what would you guys like to add? Yeah, in our, in our little breakout room, we had Ashley asked a good question about how do you know when to when to go down and, and when do you know how when to stay on your feet and how long you stay on your feet for. And I think that clip there, just, it sums it up completely. Like, if he goes down, it's an easy square to the other attacker tapping. Um, if he stays on his feet, the, the, the attacker's got to make the decision. Uh, if we go down, we make the decision for them. So, it's all about anticipating what's going to happen. Alisson saw, obviously saw the player to his right he knew that was an option to square it, stayed on his feet. He actually opened his body out as well um, to sort of block off that. And then he anticipated it and it, the awareness to, to deal with that bouncing ball, to flick it away. And then the sharpness again to get back on his feet and set for the, for the next shot coming in if there was one. Uh, but again, all the defenders were there to, to back him up at the end of it. So he slowed down the play and made sure his defenders got back and helped him out. Nice. Sam, Anybody Steve? else? Anybody else? 
Uh, yeah, actually, Chad's point was almost identical to mine in that um, a lot of times, keep, especially younger keepers, do you want to, as soon as they start coming off their line, they think that they got to go straight for that ball and they start angling their body, um, exposing a lot of pull instead of, you know, recognizing to get into that set position to either block or spread um, and knowing those fine de details. Um, so I completely agree with uh, his point. Everything he said was uh, exactly I think, right. Eric, that, that's what we wanted to do when we, when we put this together. Yep. was to make sure that we gave all of you guys, goalkeepers I'm talking to now, coaches, you know, you'll absorb this as well. But to just give you a view of what all of the different options are in any given situation, because no two situations are the same. Now, unless we give you an idea of, of the decision-making processes, what might go through your mind, what they actually look like in real life, and that's what you've seen in the clips, but then to discuss them, strip them apart, break them down. That's what we're trying to do here for you guys. Now, the next part is for you to go and practice this. We can't do that for you. We can encourage your coaches and you coaches to go and deliver practices around this that's going to give the, you guys the chance to make those decisions. But ultimately now, what we need you to do is put yourself in a position where you're going to have to make these decisions. And that's not just with you and your coach. You need to be working with your teammates, with players. Sometimes you, it has to happen in a game and sometimes you're going to get it wrong and that's going to happen. So don't worry yeah. about that. Deal with that. Move forward. You know, that will happen. So don't fear making the mistakes because you're never going to get it right 100% of the time. So more time than not, the more practice you have, the better your decision-making will become, the less mistakes you will make. But you have to have an idea that you've now got lots of different options based on all of the detail that we shared with you. I, I love that last line, Tony. And I think some kids don't really grasp that because they're emotionally scarred because they got beat. En embrace failure, guys, especially with a new technique because you're going to learn from it. And the more you just use that as a learning situation and not a failing moment, you're going to just see leaps and bounds. So practice these techniques, get yourself in an uncomfortable position to learn from these situations, but great job, Tony. Thank you very much. No oh, pleasure. It's been a, a collection of us all a collaborative uh, between everybody. So all the coaches here have all played a part and it's been fantastic to share all this with you. Eric, I think that, that, that really is um, the end of the, the detail that we've got on this. I think we need to finish it off next week. Yep. Um, we're going to have some fun with it. So next week we're going to we're going to do like a little bit of a quiz to start with, and we're going to look at how much of this have you understood, but more around those out of possession principles of defending the goal, defending the area, defending the space. We're going to be showing you a lot of clips. You're going to be making decisions on what you think they are, what part of the uh, our philosophy the goalkeepers are working from in that situation, and then we're going to do like a clip-based uh, webinar where we'll be looking at a lot of different clips, discussing a lot of different things, but really just finishing off this part of what we're doing with a lot of interaction from the goalkeepers and, and, and seeing what you've actually learned from, from this, uh, this group of webinars. Yeah, next, next fun one. That, the summary is always a good one. I know when we did it with distribution, everyone really enjoyed that one. Yeah. Um, guys, from personally, Ryan, Coach Chad, Thank you, guys. I really hope this turns into a weekly meeting with the two of you and your goalkeepers. Um, Sam, Sam, Steve, thank you very much as well. Chad, Ryan, any last second words before we call it a day? Thank you, Just, guys. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, I personally appreciate all of this, man. I'm a, I'm a student at the game, and this is something, again, I eat, sleep, and breathe, breathe goalkeeping. I mentioned to you, I only read when I'm reading goalkeeping stuff. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited to, 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 you know, bring my goalkeepers a part of this, you know, because it's only helped evolve the cycle. And, you know, I grow, they grow, and U.S. grow, and the world grow, you know. So as goalkeepers, we're in this together. We need to support each other as much as possible, you know. So thank you for having me, Tony and Eric, man. Chad, mad respect. Good seeing you, dude. Always. Thank you, guys. All, All right, right on. Thank you, Eric, guys. About, has anybody, has our keepers got any questions? Any of our young goalkeepers, any questions? 
No questions. Thank y'all. All right, all right. Everyone in the United States, have a happy and safe holiday. Please be smart. Everyone in the UK, amen. Have a great weekend. We'll see y'all next Friday. Coaches, yep. coaches stay on. Coaches, stay on. Coaches, stay on. Okay. See you, keepers. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank y'all.